Good evening to you all, and welcome to the New York Society Library's lecture series. My name is Starling Lawrence. I am an editor at W. W. Norton and Company, and it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Ian Toll, with whom I have worked for many years. His topic tonight is his book, *The Twilight of the Gods: War in the Western Pacific, 1944 to 1945* which Nathaniel Philbrick has called an epic masterpiece of military history. It is the triumphant final volume of Mr. Toll's Pacific War Trilogy. Forgive me for coming to you via audio only. There is simply not enough bandwidth up here in my corner of Northwest Connecticut to allow me to attempt this via video. I have known about Ian Toll since September 11, 2002, when I received from his agent, Eric Simonoff, the proposal on his first book, Six Frigates, a history of the early American Navy and of those magnificent ships. That anniversary date was chosen by the author. He was marking a fresh start after our year of mourning 9-11, turning a new page to remind us how America had responded to a terrorist threat two centuries earlier, that of the Barbary pirates. The proposal for Six Frigates, which eventually became chapter one of the book, was an eye-opener and perhaps particularly so to me. My decade of work in reintroducing the Aubrey Maturin novels by Patrick O'Brien to American readers had had ended shortly after that author's death in early 2000. But the proposal on my desk about what it was like to serve in battle on the deck of a man of war at the start of the 19th century was so thrilling, so graphic, so arrestingly and elegantly expressed that it could have been the voice of Patrick O'Brien himself speaking from beyond the grave. I checked those pages for bloodstains and bone fragments. Ian Toll himself had arrived at the moment of our figurative meeting by an interesting route. He had worked as a professional writer for several institutions, most recently the Federal Reserve. But somewhere along the way he had made, without knowing it, a decision that would be fatal to his line of work. He picked up a book by Patrick O'Brien and began to read. And he kept on reading. Before long, he was completely down the rabbit hole, and he thought to himself, that's what I want to do. Mine was not the only desk in New York on which the Six Frigates proposal landed, although it might have been. It was known in publishing circles that I had handled the Patrick O'Brien project and had accompanied him on his promotional tours around the United States. A distinguished editor at another publishing company complained in feigned annoyance, I can't imagine why any other editor in New York would offer on this proposal. Clearly, it was written for Starling Lawrence alone. Well, lots of editors did bid on the book, including the one quoted above, but Norton won in the end. Those of you who have been paying attention may have noticed that I have avoided saying anything about the book Ian will talk about tonight. He can do that better than I can. But I want to leave you with the thought that there is a strong thread between the books that O'Brien wrote and Ian Toll's nonfiction. Both authors have mastered the the art of telling a story. Of course, O'Brien was writing fiction and Toll writes history. But as Ian explains, In the early pages of volume two of the trilogy, The Conquering Tide, the kind of history that interests him and which he has perfected combines a masterly and scholarly account of the whole Pacific War with moments when his narrative gifts take over. I believe he, he refers to those narrative interludes as his deep dives. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ian Toll. Well, that was a very generous introduction by Starling Lawrence, my editor now of uh, some 18 years. 
and we've done four books together. Uh, and uh, I would say it's been very successful. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a terrific relationship and I owe a lot to him. Uh, I regret that we can't be uh, together in person uh, tonight, but I, I'm happy that we have this opportunity uh, given the pandemic. Uh, to meet virtually. This is something obviously we couldn't have done even say 20 years ago, certainly not 30 years ago. And um, and so if there's a, a silver lining in this pandemic, perhaps it's that it struck at a time when technology exists uh, for us to meet virtually in this way. And certainly 2020 would have been a, a ruinously uh, awful year to try to launch a new book uh, without this opportunity. I've done, <clears throat> I haven't counted them all up, but I think I want to say that without exaggeration, I've done about 30 of these virtual events since this book was published in September. And um, uh, it's it's been an opportunity to to interact with, with people. And I think we've all gotten better at this since we've, uh, as we've gotten more experience with it. As Star said, I, I really came to my, my interest in uh, writing naval history uh, through my, my love of the literature and the lore of the sea. And that had begun really before I picked up a book by Patrick O'Brien, even back in high school, I remember reading authors like Conrad and Melville. And um, there, there was something about those naturalist uh, themes of um, man against the sea uh, that um, that I had always just kind of called to me. Uh, and it's, a, it's an old theme in literature. It goes even back to the Iliad. Uh, but O'Brien and, and his 20 brilliant novels, uh, still, I think, some of the very best historical fiction that's ever been written, uh, really brought me uh, down the path that led to that first book, Six Frigates. Um, <clears throat> I had initially... Uh, consider Six Frigates to be a, a sort of a one-off. It was a project, um, you know, after the dot-com bubble had imploded and then we had 9-11. I, I had a strong feeling that I wanted to do something different with my life, at least for a while. And so the idea I had was to try to publish a book, a history of the uh, founding of the U.S. Navy. It was a subject that I had, I had gleaned a lot of knowledge about over many years, uh, just through my own reading. Star told the story of uh, how that came to be published. Uh, and I had always thought that uh, I would, if I was lucky enough to publish that book, I would write it, and then I would go back to my ordinary life. Uh, and instead, it was a success, enough of a success that Star sat me down and, and asked me what was next. And I ran through a few ideas, uh, but one of them was to uh, write a one-volume history of the Pacific War, which I thought of as a, a kind of a bookend to Six Frigates, even though it was crossing, you know, some more than a century of, of history. Uh, it was in some ways the sort of logical endpoint to a story that began with Six Frigates. Uh, that is the growth of the United States as a major power, and particularly a major naval power. And uh, a star essentially said, uh, if you'll commit to write that book, uh, I'll write you a contract right now. So I took that deal, and <clears throat> I'm glad that I did. Uh, but when I look back, uh, it's it's extraordinary to me that I ever thought I could do this in one volume. Uh, as I began the process of assembling the research uh, for this history, I had to overcome some significant doubts in my own mind. Uh, a few minutes browsing in any library or bookstore uh, will remind you just how much has been published about every aspect of the Second World War. Uh, but as I got uh, deeper into the research, some of it, some of which was done at the Society Library, by the way, uh, which has a remarkably uh, large collection of uh, early World War II memoirs, many of which are long out of print and very rare. Um, but as I as I uh, uh, assembled that research. Uh, I, I gained a confidence in the justice of my cause because as long as the world, as large as the World War II literature is, it, it really is quite lopsided. Certain aspects of that great conflict have been worked over to the point of exhaustion. 
past the point of exhaustion in my view, while others have been surprisingly neglected. Uh, studies of the Allied High Command in particular, I think have never quite succeeded in pulling together a convincing across the board account of its deliberations and decisions affecting the Pacific theater. Uh, the uh, subject has suffered, I think, from the twin biases of uh, a much more attention um, on the war in Europe, uh, whereas the war in the Pacific was really a different war uh, that happened to be fought at the same time. And, um, and, and a, a second um, a bias, which I think maybe is axiomatic of military history, which is to, to think of war first as war on land and only secondly as a war at sea. Uh, the field has been deeply enriched by so many work in so many aspects of this conflict. New archives have opened, new oral histories have been recorded, new memoirs are published, new and old Japanese sources uh, have been translated, and talented writers and scholars uh, in the United States and the Allied countries and Japan have shed light on various aspects of the conflict. So what could I possibly add uh, that's new. It is a mature literature. Uh, there is no use in denying that. Uh, and, um, and that is true generally of, of the Second World War. And yet, uh, I think it's too easy to become cynical about that. Um, very often, I've met people who uh, tell me that there couldn't possibly be anything new uh, to add to the literature of the Pacific War. And, uh, and that conviction seems to be strongest among people who have read very little about the subject. Um, I could go through chapter by chapter and tell you what new sources I've developed. If you read the book, uh, you'll see that yourself. But I, I would prefer to turn to something else, which I think is that um, the architecture of a narrative like this, I think, is half the battle. Because as the literature grows richer and more varied, it, it tends to become disjointed and piecemeal. And in, with respect to the Pacific in general, I think we've had a conspicuous lack of well-integrated narratives about the war in its entirety. Uh, and so when you enter a crowded literature like this, uh, where you see inevitably fragmentation and specialization, uh, there's a lot to be achieved simply by integrating all of those pieces into, into one coherent uh, narrative, one story that tells the whole story uh, that works on a larger palette. And um, my, my philosophy of the nonfiction narrative is uh, to move constantly from one perspective to another as you would move around a complex three-dimensional object, for example. You're constantly looking at it from new perspectives, new angles. Uh, you're moving in close to look at, at the uh, finer points of the surface and then you're backing up so that you can see the entire shape. Um, I remember a review of my first book, Six Frigates. I don't remember where it ran, but the reviewer uh, who was mostly positive about the book said, had one note of criticism. He said that I had a bad habit of straying out of my lane, that is leaving the realm of military history and digressing into politics, diplomacy, and economics. And I have to plead guilty to that. I do stray out of my lane. Uh, I do it quite a bit. I like doing it. I've done it again in, in this trilogy, and I intend to do it in all future books of history that I may write. I think that military history, especially naval history, has suffered from this uh, stay in your lane uh, kind of syndrome. And to be provocative, um, I would say that the subject of naval history in particular is too important to be left to naval historians. Um, even today, I encounter very often the preconception that uh, uh, military history, particularly naval history, is a boring subject, a boring genre. It needn't be. It shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think much of, of what has been important in terms of the scholarship of uh, naval history in general and the history of this war in particular has been the province of specialists uh, who have drawn their mandate very narrowly about strategy, operations, tactics, and much of naval history has been written by scholars uh, who are directly affiliated in one way or another uh, with our Navy, many employed directly by the Navy. And I think there's power in approaching a subject uh, from the outside. I have nothing but the greatest respect uh, for our military and for our Navy, but I'm no way, in no way beholden to it. And, 
and I've, I've never hesitated to puncture some of its myths. Uh, so my, my narrative integrates a, a merger of, of kind of high strategic considerations um, with the realm of politics and foreign policy. Uh, and in particular, when we come to the last year of the Second World War, uh, the uh, preoccupation that many leaders had uh, looking forward in uh, the construction of a stable, peaceful post-war order. And so uh, I, I tell the story of, of how the big decisions were made in this war in the halls of power in Washington and Tokyo, uh, including an analysis of strategic decisions of, and policymaking at the top of the regimes in the inner circles of power. Uh, but then I shift the view abruptly and repeatedly to the view from the foxholes, the decks, and the cockpits, and then back. And it's, it's the uh, frequent uh, abrupt shifting of narratives, uh, of narrative perspectives uh, that I think is kind of at the core of how I try to do what I do. Uh, first person accounts um, really feed the narrative and that's true of every level. So up and down the chain of command uh, from the circle of advisors around President Roosevelt and President Truman uh, to the inner circle of power in uh, Tokyo uh, to the pinnacle and, and to understand the complex decision-making through the eyes of those who were there in the room and participated in the decision. Uh, but then also the way the war was lived and experienced by all people, of course, the frontline fighters, the, um, the soldiers, the Marines, the sailors, the airmen, uh, but then also the ordinary people at home uh, and in Japan, the, the so-called home front. I've always thought that that was an important uh, part of any uh, story of any war and, um, and I've, I've woven in, into this narrative as well. Um, history uh, is also storytelling. History has always been storytelling. Really, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, Herodotus, Thucydides, uh, the idea that history was something other than literature is uh, relatively recent, really. It dates back maybe a little more than a century. Uh, you, know, you know, storytelling can, can be a, an inadequate way of really getting to the bottom of what happened in history because it often will stumble over complexity. Um, but on the other hand, storytelling can contribute to our understanding by bringing us readers closer to those who lived it uh, and who made it, who made history, who made the decisions. Uh, and so I think storytelling uh, types of narratives have a really important role to play in scholarship. And, and that's a somewhat counterintuitive and even controversial idea, but it's one that I believe very strongly. One way to understand history is, is simply that it's an aggregation of all of the individual experiences of those who were there. Uh, and uh, that's been the philosophy that I've, I've always used with my work. Storytelling through first person accounts is a time honored way to do history. Uh, no aspect of World War II, of course, is virgin territory. Uh, but even now, just because there are so many narratives uh, and of course, you can still interview World War II veterans, and that's something I've done a good bit of. Uh, but there are also just an enormous number of um, important firsthand accounts that are sitting in various archives and uh, which have not been, been mined. And so it, it is a, 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 a effectively sort of an unlimited universe of sources. Uh, so back to uh, a Star and me. He, um, generously gave me this contract to write this one volume, uh, History of the Pacific War. Again, I really wince to recall uh, that I ever thought that was possible. I started writing and, um, and by 2010, uh, with my deadline, um, you know, a year, less than a year away, uh, I had um, something like 800 pages and I had just run through the Battle of Midway. The Battle of Midway was almost exactly six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. In other words, it was six months into a war that lasted 44 months. And, um, and I, I remember uh, sort of uh, wringing my hands quite a bit over how I was gonna tell my editor about this problem. And, uh, but when I called him, I remember quite clearly, uh, I told him what was going on and he said right on that same phone call without even asking to read what I had written, let's just turn this into a trilogy. And, uh, and so the contract was amended. Uh, volume one, The Civic Crucible, uh, was published in 2011. That covered the first six months of the war uh, from Pearl Harbor to our 
uh, counterpunch at Midway. Volume two, The Conquering Tide, uh, told the story of the middle two years of the war from mid-1942 through mid-1944 and the Allied counteroffensives in the South and Central Pacific. And this volume is the third and the last picking up after the Marianas campaign uh, and covering the last year of the war through the Japanese surrender in August 1945. And I believe I can claim that this trilogy will be the first history of the entire Pacific War to be published in at least 25 years and the first multi-volume chronicle of the Naval War uh, since Samuel Elliott Morrison's 15-volume series, which was published in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, the Pacific War is, in some ways, uh, still a forgotten war. And I think that's particularly true of the sea war in the Pacific. It was the largest naval and sea war in history, and yet it was overshadowed by the European War, and to some extent by uh, the various land campaigns and island fighting uh, that occurred in the Pacific. Um, <clears throat> the um, a singular fame of Douglas MacArthur, uh, I think has uh, contributed somewhat to this association we have uh, in the Pacific with uh, the, um, the fighting that occurred on islands and on land. Um, but these, these double biases really, Europe over the Pacific, um, land fighting over sea fighting, I think has, has kept uh, this subject somewhat, somewhat obscure really. And, and it, it continues today, uh, you know, by its very nature, uh, there can be no battlefield monuments uh, for a naval war. Uh, the only monument you'll see of a battle, like the Battle of Midway, for example, is an eternal blue seascape. And there was also no singular figure uh, in America's uh, uh, naval history, like a, a Horatio Nelson, uh, and um, uh, certainly no, no one to, to compare with a Douglas MacArthur. Uh, the Pacific War was, as I've been saying, a, a naval war and an air war. Uh, where land uh, fighting on land, island fighting, uh, played a supporting role. That's an inverse, really, of what happened in Europe, which was a, a vast, uh, vastly large uh, land campaign uh, in which naval operations played a, a supporting role. Uh, the Pacific War was the only sea war that has been waged across the entire length and breadth of the Pacific, an ocean so large that you could fit all of the world's combined land masses into it with room to spare, and it was in all likelihood, and, and we can hope, the largest naval war that will ever be waged. It was an amphibious war, uh, amphibious war striking an enemy on land by way of sea. It was the largest, bloodiest, most technically difficult, most logistically complex amphibious war in history. And uh, one, one thing about amphibious war is that it really does require the different military services to, uh, to interact and to cooperate. Uh, at length in an intricate and sustained way. And so the, the rivalries and the frictions between the different military services is an important theme at the heart of this trilogy. And that's in the case, both on the allied side and also on the Japanese side. Uh, the war in the Pacific was the only instance in which opposing fleets of aircraft carriers met in battle. There were five such battles in the war. Uh, it provided the most complete demonstration of the means by which submarines could destroy enemy supply lines. It had led to a fundamental revolution in naval doctrines, uh, putting an end to the era of the big gun battleship and establishing carrier aviation and submarining as the principal means of waging war at sea. Uh, with the uh, strike on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, uh, the scale and the suddenness of the Japanese challenge uh, came as a great surprise. Uh, the power of this small and uh, recently fairly obscure Asian island nation was much greater than believed, and the initial challenge um, seemed almost impossible to overcome. Japan's devastating surprise air raid on Pearl Harbor knocked all eight battleships of the Pacific Fleet out of action on the first day of the war, indeed really just the first 15 minutes of the Pacific War. Uh, but this was the event that brought the United States into the Second World War. And for that reason, I think it must be reckoned as the central historical event of the 20th century. It was the real turning point of World War II, not just in the Pacific, but in Europe, uh, in the beginning of an era of American internationalism that continues to this day. 
What was left in the aftermath of that cataclysmic defeat were aircraft carriers and submarines. And the loss of the battleships on day one of this uh, war forced the Navy to let go of traditional naval doctrines. Uh, it forced the service to innovate on the fly, to develop and refine new technologies and weapons, including aviation, carrier warfare, submarine warfare, radar, radio intelligence, uh, and to meet the stupendous logistics and supply problems involved in uh, pushing a fleet and, uh, and projecting overwhelming military power across the interminable distances of the largest ocean in the world. Uh, the book that I have published uh, most recently, Twilight of the Gods, the third in the trilogy, uh, deals with the last year of the war uh, in 1944 and 1945. This was a period in which both sides knew that Japan had lost the war. Uh, but there was a difference between defeat and surrender, uh, between unconditional surrender and uh, allowing, a, a, from the Japanese point of view, a barbarian army to enter their homeland and occupy it and supervise the disarmament of the Japanese military. Uh, in, in this period, really following the fall of the Marianas in uh, the summer of 1944, uh, Japan was fighting essentially to prevent um, that outcome. Uh, total defeat in the form of occupation of their homeland. And the savagery and the desperation of those island fights as the campaign grew close, closer to Japan uh, brought us to uh, really some of the darkest and most uh, terrible uh, chapters in the history of all of warfare. This was the year in which the, the uh, American Navy won the largest uh, naval battle in history at the Battle of Leyte Gulf in which Douglas MacArthur made good his pledge to return to the Philippines, uh, in which waves of kamikazes attacked the Allied fleets, uh, where the Japanese fought to the last man on one island after another. B-29 bombers burned down Japanese cities, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki were vaporized in atomic blasts. So if the Pacific War had been a game of chess played between grandmasters, there would have been no endgame. Uh, with the outcome no longer in doubt, the Japanese player uh, would have laid his king down on the board and shaken hands with his opponent. But this was war, not a board game, and conditions in Japan did not allow for the possibility of a negotiated truce until long after defeat had become inevitable. Another 1.5 million Japanese servicemen and civilians were to be sacrificed like so many pawns uh, before the checkmate in August 1945. And those one and a half million estimated deaths in the last year of this conflict uh, represented about one half of the total Japanese killed in the wars of Asia and the Pacific from 1937 to 1945. And nearly half of those Japanese killed in that year were civilians, uh, most of whom uh, killed in the fire firebombing uh, raids on Japanese cities or the two atomic attacks. Uh, even in this final year, though, of the war, uh, Japanese military forces showed great valor and audacity and occasional flashes of brilliance. Uh, the army largely abandoned its costly practice of these bonsai charges, these massed uh, charges across open ground on uh, uh, disciplined, well-armed and entrenched allied troops. They had learned uh, the hard way in battle after battle uh, that those tactics did not work. On Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa especially, uh, the Japanese army revealed its proficiency in the use of ingenious and very extensive subterranean, or as they call them, honeycomb, uh, defensive fortifications. They dug deep into the ground. They dug tunnels and bunkers. Uh, and that largely vitiated uh, the American advantages in artillery and air power. And the kamikazes, the, uh, which were essentially um, guided missiles uh, guided by a man uh, were a singularly Japanese phenomenon arising in a unique cultural context. But in tactical terms, uh, to be able to deploy what was in effect a guided missile in 1945, it was like bringing a weapon from the future into the conflict. I think there was a, a science fiction movie about this um, uh, with a, a similar theme, but with a twist. 
Um, the Japanese essentially were able to deploy these guided missiles at a time when no other combatant possessed uh, such weapons or effective means to counter them. I want to uh, stop because I want to leave plenty of time for discussion and questions and so forth, but I'll just end with, with this one thought. I, I sometimes I'm asked why my interest in military history. Well, <clears throat> I mean, part of it is that there's an 11 year old boy in every man. Um, but a less facetious answer might be that uh, we study war because war is, is a test. War is a force that has shaped our history, all history. Uh, it's a test of nations and systems of government, of peoples and of individuals. And um, you think about what engineers do. They stress test uh, materials. Uh, they stress test uh, uh, structures, a, a steel girder, a bridge, or a software program. What does stress testing do? It, you place something under stress, you get information about it uh, that you can't get otherwise. War uh, is like a stress test uh, for societies. It tells you something about them and uh, something that uh, it gives you data that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get by studying that same society in peacetime. And I, I think that is the, the best and the strongest answer for why to, why to read and why to do military history. Uh, something that I think has been forgotten in, in many of our academies, many of our universities where military history has been uh, largely out of fashion uh, for, for many years. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we are, are pulling out of this COVID um, pandemic now. Um, and I, I think there's a parallel to be drawn. Uh, this pandemic uh, is a crisis. It has tested us. And I, uh, I'm sorry to say, I, I don't think that, that the information we've gotten about our society, our nation, uh, has, has been that encouraging, uh, really. But uh, World War II, in many ways, made this country a, a stronger country. Uh, and I choose to be optimistic that uh, coming out of this pandemic, uh, we may, there may be a time when we'll, we'll be able to look back on this year uh, that we've just been, been through. And, and with uh, benefit of, of um, some time to, to think about it and reflect upon it and gather our, gather our thoughts about it and gain some perspective, uh, we'll be able to look back and say uh, that was a, like a wake-up call. Uh, it, it shocked us into, um, into getting to be a little more serious as a country about dealing with the many serious problems that we face. So I'll shut up there for now, and I, I really look forward to entertaining any uh, questions or comments you may have. That was really brilliant and gave me at least a lot of food for thought. I'm sure the same is true of others. Um, so we do have some great questions here in the chat, and uh, I'm going to jump in with one here, um, a comment. Uh, thank you. The fastest 800 pages I've ever read, says one participant. How did you get all the information from the Japanese side, all the memoirs and letters and so forth? <clears throat> well, as I said, I, um, the, uh, the amount that's available in English, um, I don't read Japanese, but the amount that's, Eng that's available in English has really grown quite significantly in the past 25 years. And so I essentially took, a, took an approach of... Um, trying to get my hands on everything and um, everything that was in English. And I, I can't tell you honestly that I got a hold of everything uh, that has been published in English, but I certainly got a hold of uh, a lot of it. And, um, and so I, I, I took that sort of approach. Uh, there are a number of um, excellent collections of oral histories. Uh, there are <clears throat> collections of, of letters and diaries that have been uh, translated and published in, in English. Uh, and um, I essentially combed through all of that stuff, the uh, USS BS reports. This is the strategic bombing survey. The allies went in and interrogated um, uh, military leaders up and down the command chain, uh, all of that sitting in archives. And so essentially, I, I just went through and mined all of that material and tried to weave it into the narrative. Um, someone comments, I think your Pacific trilogy is similar to Rick Atkinson's trilogy on World War II in Europe. How do you compare your writing to his? And there's a complimentary question. Have you thought at all about writing a series about the European theater now that you've done the Pacific theater? 
Yeah, well, Rick, uh, I, you know, I've got a lot of respect for, for what Rick has done, uh, have read the series. And um, I think, uh, you know, there, you know, obviously we both have written trilogies. Uh, I think we're both very interested in, in the storytelling uh, aspects of constructing a narrative, making the pages turn. Uh, and so the, um, the comparison is often made. I also think if we had Star here, uh, he would say that uh, the success of Atkins' uh, trilogy gave him a little bit of confidence in uh, deciding to go forward with the trilogy uh, for us. I, um, I have not um, given serious thought to writing about the war in Europe. Um, I, uh, it would take a, a, quite a significant investment of time and effort for me uh, to build the knowledge base. And so really, I, I think, you know, I'd be looking at another 15 years of my life. I um, have spent my late 30s, all of my 40s, and my early 50s on this one subject. It's a labor of a lifetime. And, um, and so I don't see tackling the European theater. Um, a couple of interesting theoretical or sort of tactical questions here. Um, didn't the Soviet Red Army defeat of Japan in Mongolia from May through September 1939 compel Japan to move south for Indonesian oil rather than west, which led in turn to the attack on Pearl Harbor. So kind of how did Japan's motivations leading up to the war and to the attack on Pearl Harbor in particular? Yeah, I think that's true. So for, for those of you who may not, may not know, there was an undeclared border war uh, between uh, the Soviet Red Army and the Japanese Kwantung Army in Manchuria in uh, 1939. This was actually a pretty large series of uh, uh, ground attacks and counterattacks uh, that took place. And uh, the Soviets really got the better of the Japanese in that series of, of these border sh skirmishes, uh, which I think it, you know, there is evidence that that influenced uh, the Japanese thinking they rushed to strengthen that army in Manchuria, but they had much more of a defensive mindset following that series of, of clashes. Uh, they were also bogged down in China in their war in China. And so uh, mounting an invasion of Siberia, I don't think was was considered to be a, a you know, a, a realistic option uh, for the Japanese. Now they were watching carefully the war between Germany and, and Russia. And if it looked like Russia was going to collapse entirely on the Eastern front in their war against uh, the Soviets, then they might they might have struck opportunistically into into Siberia, but uh, yes, I think that, that that did play into the decision eventually to uh, to strike Pearl and to allow the Navy to do what they were arguing, and what really they had built the Japanese Navy to do, which was to go south to seize territory and to obtain their own oil supply in the East Indies. And was the use of nuclear weapons once the United States had them was their use against Japanese cities unavoidable? Big question. Well, it certainly is a very big question. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my own view is that, uh, you know, we, we could have used the atomic bombs and not necessarily hit cities. Um, you know, what would that have led to? Well, it's, it's very difficult to speculate given all the factors involved. Uh, but yes, we could have hit purely military targets. Um, we would have made the point to the Japanese that we had this weapon. Uh, and I think we would have avoided the, you know, the his historical burden of ha having been the only nation to use these weapons and to have used them without warning against cities. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, really, it, it, this is a difficult moral and ethical question, one that will be de debated uh, you know, into the future and will never really be settled. And um, I'm often asked if, you know, digging into the archives, have you found the answer here, whether we should have used the atomic bombs, whether we should have used them in the way that we use them? My answer is the answer is not in the archives. Uh, there is, there's no part of this picture that we haven't learned. We have a pretty full understanding of the decision to use the atomic bombs. Uh, hard to see how some new documentary find in some archive would alter the picture. Uh, and so uh, really what we're dealing with is um, a, a, a very difficult moral and ethical question, uh, which as I say, will not be resolved. My own view is, is that uh, 
if it was possible to do this by hitting uh, legitimate military targets rather than cities, uh, I would have preferred that uh, in terms of the legacy uh, for the for the United States. Has there been interest in your trilogy in Japan? Yes, it's been published in Japan. Um, I'm told that it's selling. When I ask my editor over there how it's selling, he always says, we're seeing steady sales, which of course can mean anything. Um, but um, it is in print there, and um, it is in print in China as well. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I can only hope that um, uh, more readers will continue to find it in Asia. Great. Can you talk about the impact the Army Air Force had in protecting and providing cover for the Navy? Well, it's a big, uh, it's a big story. The Army Air Forces, which of course became the Air Force, uh, had um, a really important role to play in every different aspect of the Pacific War. Um, in, in general, uh, during the middle period of the war, especially, and in the Central Pacific, in distinction to the South Pacific, uh, <clears throat> the each successive offensive thrust against the Japanese was being waged across uh, hundreds or even thousands of miles of open ocean. And in that situation, the land-based air forces simply didn't have the range to play a significant role, which is why the, the Navy's carrier air power, uh, carrier air task, task forces uh, really were the, the only game uh, that we had essentially for attacking the Marianas, for example, prior to our conquest of that of those islands. Of course, once we took the islands, uh, they became the principal springboard for the B-29 attacks on the Japanese homeland. And the B-29, uh, really an unprecedented airplane at that time with a, uh, you know, a range of some 3,000 miles, being able to carry 10 tons of bombs uh, over that distance, uh, to be able to launch from airfields in the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, Tinian, uh, and to be able to strike the Tokyo and the industrial heart of Japan uh, became an absolutely essential sort of factor in um, eventually forcing the Japanese to recognize that they had been defeated. Um, can you speak a little about training and mobilization? Um, a participant points out in the lead up to December 7th, 1941, some divisions were already mobilizing, but when it was time to ship out, how prepared were they? Um, how do you think improper training contributed to casualty counts in 1942 and 43? And how does this compare with what, how Australia and New Zealand mobilized? I break that. Well, those are, uh, those, those are all excellent questions, very specific questions. Um, and I'll pull back and speak a little more generally just for, for the general audience. Um, yeah, we, we uh, were not well prepared uh, for the Second World War by and large, I would say. And um, that was true across all services. Uh, we had not um, mobilized our forces. We were beginning to mobilize. Um, and in many cases, what training we, we had done uh, was not the right kind of training. That was particularly true with regard to anti-aircraft weaponry on, the, on our, our Navy's warships, for example. Um, the story of, of the Second World War, of American involvement in the Second World War, is really that uh, the Japanese took advantage of our lack of readiness in order to surprise us at Pearl Harbor, uh, and then also really to very quickly win air supremacy throughout the Western Pacific, both against the U.S. and against the British, uh, essentially wipe the skies clean of our airplanes. Uh, our planes weren't good enough. Our pilots weren't good enough. Their planes were much better than we knew, uh, partly because they had deliberately concealed the full capabilities uh, of their air power. And their pilots were among some of the best in the world. And of course, they had been tempered by the air war over China. Um, <clears throat> the saving, what, what saved um, this country was really the fact that we had two very large oceans separating us from our enemies. Uh, that gave us the time we needed to catch our breath, uh, to recover, and, um, and to stabilize the situation uh, in the Pacific 
And we really only needed to stabilize it for about a year. And at the end of that first year of the war, uh, the Titanic uh, munitions production capabilities of our economy and the, the sort of fully mobilized American people uh, were uh, making the, the power of our, the inherent power of our country make it, uh, was making itself felt uh, on, the, on the battlefronts in the Pacific. And at that point, it really just became a matter of time. Uh, we uh, gradually overwhelmed the Japanese in a way that I think it's very hard to see any other outcome you can see you can see how the Pacific War might have been fought differently. It's very hard to see how the outcome could have been any different. Um, we've got some really great and thorny questions here in the chat. Uh, just to jump down the list a little bit. Um, so, in history, the victors and participants tell tend to tell the story in the best light for themselves. Did you have difficulty sorting yeah. out objective perspectives? Of course, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is to acknowledge uh, that um, there are limits to how objective anyone can be, particularly when you're writing about your own country. Uh, <clears throat> I remember one discussion with a, a Japanese historian. He told me history is written by the victors. You hear that slogan sometimes. I'm not sure that's true, that history is written by the victors. Have you picked up a, an American high school textbook recently? Um, but it certainly is true that um, a perspective, maybe in this case more than any other, the two perspectives are, are going to be so different. And to you know, read the, what the Japanese historians have to say, to talk to them, to interact with them, is to understand that this is a country that views this war differently. Now, the J Japanese have been accused of, of amnesia and of um, refusing to kind of look closely at what their forces did in particular, in terms of uh, atrocities, behavior, treatment of POWs. All of that is true. I think it's also <clears throat> true that the Japanese have made great progress uh, in facing up to the war uh, to a greater extent. Um, but the question was about my ob objectivity, and I, I can only say that, um, that, you know, that as a starting point, you know, be aware of it. Just be aware uh, that, um, of course, I'm likely to see things through the eyes of an American researcher looking at this. And I think anyone who's read my books will, will see that I have a lot of pride in what we achieved as a country uh, during that period. Uh, at the same time, you know, I think it serves the, the, uh, the cause of storytelling uh, to reveal even those aspects of, of this war that don't necessarily do our nation proud and to recognize the internal frictions of our coalition, uh, just how much time we spend arguing with each other, uh, the, um, the um, you know, ma massive inefficiencies of, of a democracy mobilizing for war uh, the fact that political partisanship remained very intense throughout the Second World War, something that's often forgotten. Uh, the 1944 presidential campaign waged, this was FDR running for an unprecedented fourth presidential term against Tom Dewey, the governor of New York, two New Yorkers who hated each other. Uh, the uh, vicious partisanship uh, in Washington uh, throughout the war is something that I think has been sort of forgotten. It's hard to remember how polarizing and controversial a figure FDR was in his own time now that his legacy has been engraved in marble and we sort of collectively agree that he was our greatest president of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm wandering a bit, which I do sometimes. It was a bit of an open-ended question, but um, I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to tell the story in a way that does justice to the history uh, and, uh, and which keeps uh, my own inherent lack of objectivity in check. Um, to sort of append to that, um, you mentioned earlier Samuel Eliot Morrison, who had um, published a, a massive multi-volume previous history of the same subject matter. Um, our participant points out here that he, Morrison, benefited from being a first-hand observer of the events he describes in his history of naval operations, but do yes. you believe it affected his objectivity? 
Well, Morrison, uh, Morrison was a was a, um, a kind of a cantankerous figure, immensely talented figure, um, friend of FDR's, Harvard professor, and uh, you know, right after the attack on Pearl, he essentially convinced FDR to place him in charge of writing what would be the official history of, of the Navy's war. And uh, and so really it is a unique, uh, sort of a unique situation for all military historians um, in, in history to have the kind of access he had, to have the ability, as the questioner says, to see some of these events through his own eyes, uh, to be in direct contact with so many of the leaders. He befriended uh, many of the leading figures in the Navy. Um, you know, so one has to admit that, you know, that sort of a situation naturally is going to uh, compromise one's objectivity. On the other hand, his, his, uh, he really did a job on, on some of the Navy's leaders, Halsey in particular. Halsey had been a friend of his. Uh, <clears throat> I went through all the correspondence. I went through the Morrison's papers and, uh, and, and the Halsey papers. I, I read all of the letters. Um, you know, the sort of warm, chatty letters during the war, dear Sam, dear Bill. And then um, uh, once Halsey, um, you know, made some of his serious command errors, all of which I, I go into in detail in the book, uh, you know, Morrison became his enemy because Morrison was determined to tell the story, uh, even if it um, uh, put Halsey in a, in a very, uh, a very poor light. And so those uh, later letters, now it's dear Morrison and, uh, Dear Admiral, my dear Admiral, and um, and Halsey uh, actually tried to uh, win uh, uh, the twelfth uh, volume of Morrison's series on Leyte Golf was published. Uh, <clears throat> Halsey tried to um, stage a sort of a public counterattack, and was convinced not to do so by his former chief of staff, uh, Mick Carney. So um, uh, you know Morrison's uh, achievement is extraordinary. Um, of course, it's not fully objective. Uh, it, it was a product of the time that it was written. Uh, it was written about the U.S. Navy's war from the perspective of the Navy. Um, but uh, it will always be a, a real cornerstone of this um, of this literature. Um, so you mentioned Admiral Halsey, who certainly draws a lot of um, Charismatic personality draws a lot of controversy. Other popular one on that you also yeah. mentioned, uh, Douglas MacArthur. Um, his often outrageous conduct during the war was offset by his impressive service as Supreme Commander uh, for the Allied Powers in occupied Japan. Can you talk a little bit about his charisma and how his uh, image suffered and then was rehabilitated? Sure. MacArthur, uh, you know, I think the important starting point to to understanding MacArthur's kind of singular, unique, I mean, really no one else like him, uh, his, his career uh, as a, a military leader, is to understand that in the weeks immediately after the strike on Pearl Harbor, really just December 1941, that month, uh, MacArthur skyrocketed into a position of uh, fame and celebrity uh, that that placed him far above that of any other military leader. In fact, I don't think it goes too far to say that um, Douglas MacArthur, that the only other American who, who kind of loomed as large, who had the kind of standing or stature uh, or general uh, respect and adulation uh, was FDR himself. When the Gallup poll uh, first began asking the question, who's the most admired American? which they've been doing continuously, I think, since 45. Uh, MacArthur won it the first two years in a row. I think he won it four or five years total uh, and, um, and is, is the only non-president to have won it that many times. So, so beginning with that understanding, the American people are in love with this guy uh, and really have, have placed him on a pedestal. He is a hero in their eyes. Uh, it, you need to begin by understanding that. Now, MacArthur was a very gifted, uh, very talented leader. He was a narcissist. Uh, he was uh, deceitful. Uh, he was corrupt in certain ways. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and he had a, a clack of, of sort of hyper-loyal staff officers around him uh, who essentially seemed to take on a sort of uh, 
us against the world attitude uh, during the war. And, um, and that become, became damaging. Historians have been hard on Douglas MacArthur uh, for good reasons. But to balance against that, I think you have to acknowledge that MacArthur uh, understood the larger context of the Pacific War in a way that many other military leaders didn't. That is to say, he understood that Japan's challenge in the Pacific uh, was uh, an Asian country um, declaring that they were going to drive the Western colonial interlopers out of Asia. And that kind of appeal must inevitably have a, a certain kind of um, uh, gravitational uh, force among the people of Asia. And, um, and MacArthur always saw, I think more clearly, certainly than other military leaders, that the United States had to present itself uh, as a positive force in Asia, as a liberator, and as a country that was going to bring democracy and, um, and, and, and prosperity uh, to, to Asia. Uh, MacArthur formed a, a bond of trust, a very powerful bond of trust with the people of many different countries in that region, beginning with the Philippines, Australia, uh, Japan, ultimately after the war, then Korea. And so I, I think Taiwan, you could say as well. So, uh, that is an extraordinary achievement for anyone who, who wears stars and who, who serves in the military throughout his entire career uh, to, to uh, be able to sort of represent your country in, in an, a major region that way. And, um, and I think you have to acknowledge that uh, in, on the other side of the ledger uh, it, when we look at MacArthur's career. That's fascinating stuff. Um, so everybody, we've got some fantastic questions still in the chat. Thank you so much for all your engagement with this. Uh, Ian, are you good answering a couple more questions? Because we've got some rich stuff, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we'll of go course. on a little longer. So we've got a couple of questions that relate to um, technology. Um, someone points out uh, the technology changes during the war, use of radar, sonar, carrier aircraft design, uh, different munitions, and so on. A question of how did the Japanese suffer from a technology gap to the extent that there was one? Uh, and then maybe jumping off from there a little bit, can you talk about the US submarine fleet and their contributions to the US victory? Absolutely. Uh, so yes, the Japanese suffered from a technology gap and uh, that affected every aspect really of Japan's war. Uh, what's extraordinary, really, when you look at Japan is, is to realize that, you know, until the 1850s, uh, this was a uh, largely isolated Asian country ruled by uh, warriors, a feudal society ruled by warriors. Those warriors fought with swords and spears and wore suits of lacquered armor. Uh, and uh, with the Meiji Restoration, this period when the Japanese sort of saw, the samurai elite saw, uh, that they had to modernize and industrialize, and they had to do it as quickly as possible, uh, just in order to avoid essentially being, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, subject to the same sort of colonial imperialism as almost every other Asian nation. <clears throat> they uh, achieved something that really stands, I think, unique in all of history. They, uh, within a matter of um, 60, 70 years uh, became one of the leading powers in the world, inflicting uh, humiliating defeats on several different Western nations. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, at the height of, of the Japanese um, success in the Pacific, they had one of the largest empires ever brought under one flag. Uh, and, um, and so that, that was an extraordinary achievement, but it was built on a, on a soft foundation just because of how rapidly they had industrialized and they'd really strained their capabilities to build the war machine that they went to war with in, um, in 1941. And they were unable to continue advancing under the pressure of, of the war. Uh, they were unable, for example, to uh, bring <clears throat> uh, new models of aircraft or airplanes, warplanes uh, into service. Uh, they were unable to continue training enough new pilots. Um, they essentially were, uh, their, their weapons systems of all kinds, really, with few exceptions, were exactly the same in 1945 as they were in 1941. 
uh, whereas uh, the United States in particular uh, was really advancing by leaps and, and bounds. And this was because, not because we were inherently better than the Japanese, but because we were a more developed country and we were a larger country. We had an enormous complex of um, research laboratories, universities, uh, industrial firms that were all capable of very quickly retooling and focusing attention on uh, both producing new weapons of war and also improving the weapons that we had. I can go into many examples. Um, I'll just pick, pick a couple. One, uh, anti-aircraft guns. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we often hear about the Manhattan Project. We spent $2 billion on, on building the atomic bombs. The B-29 uh, bomber, which we've already talked about, we spent about $3 billion uh, on the B-29 bomber. We spent $4 billion on anti-aircraft guns and ammunition and, um, and developed some what were at the time absolutely extraordinary technologies uh, to make those guns more efficient. And by the end of the war, we were essentially just mowing down Japanese planes as they came in uh, and um, uh, using um, uh, you know, weapons that would have been far beyond uh, Japan's capability to develop during the war. And of course, the, the Manhattan Project, you know, building an atomic bomb, uh, uh, you, you know, relying on discoveries that had happened immediately prior to the Second World War, undertaking a vast a project to do something that the leading scientists in the field said they believed was probably feasible, but they couldn't say for sure. Um, uh, you know, at the outset uh, saying we'll need to enrich uh, some quantity of, of a critical mass of uranium that might be a pound. Maybe it's 200 pounds. We're not sure. If it's 200 pounds, we probably won't be able to build a bomb within the expected duration of the war. Being able to plunge in completely, essentially write a blank check to do that, um, gathering the best minds in the, in the profession not only in the United States, but those who had fled Europe to escape the rampaging armies of Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, that, that was just so far beyond what uh, Japan was capable of at that time, that when you look back on the whole picture, you see uh, really the decision, Japan's decision to attack the United States in, uh, in December 1941 has to be reckoned as one of the worst decisions in the history of, uh, history of governments or nations. Yeah. Um, and submarines role in submarine technology? Yes, the submarines. So, uh, you know, one way to tell a story, the whole story of the Pacific War, right, if I was just going to try to tell it to you in 40 words or less, is <clears throat> Japan was a country without natural resources. Uh, they had uh, managed to industrialize and to grow to the, become the power they were essentially by importing their natural resources. And... Um, and what that meant was uh, they had to bring all of this stuff, oil in particular, they had to bring it in by sea. So from the day they decided to go to war against us in the United States um, and the Allies, if we could simply destroy that, those sea links, uh, linking Japan, a nation then is now destitute in natural resources, little or no oil production, for example, if we could simply cut those sea links uh, then the war-making power of this country would collapse. And then uh, winning the war would just be a question of, of waiting. And, uh, and that essentially is what we did. Uh, we cut the sea links primarily with our submarine fleet. It was the most uh, complete example of how a, uh, uh, a nation at war can have its economy sort of kicked out from under it by a war of commerce. Um, and it was, uh, I think the, the battle in the Atlantic is, is much better remembered. Uh, and yet the achievements of the American submarine fleet operating, operating against Japan uh, were much more complete and much more devastating to the point where really after April 1945, not a single drop of oil uh, reached the Japanese homeland. And um, without domestic oil production, you can readily see what that means for the course of the war. It means that the Japanese leadership itself understood that they had absolutely no way of, uh, of maintaining its, their ability even to wage war, let alone win it. Um, 
so uh, one of our participants mentioned that they're just reading the, the Twilight section about the attack on Peleliu. Uh, it feels like you must have visited the island. Uh, did you? How many of the battle sites did you visit? Yeah, so I have not been to Peleliu. Um, and that, so that whole section I wrote really based on oral histories, although certainly spent quite a bit of time on Google Earth uh, uh, looking at the place. Um, I did spend uh, uh, two weeks on Guadalcanal and Tulagi uh, back in 2012. No, th this was a fascinating trip. Uh, I can't say that I turned up a lot. I mean, there's certainly no archives there, for example. There, there are um, uh, sort of rusting remains of tanks and, and other weapons of war that you can find. You can get a guide to, to you know, take you to places on the, in the jungle. And, um, and all of that is, is really fascinating. The airfield that we fought over on Guadalcanal, Henderson Field, is now the Honorea International Airport. It's the major airport in the Solomon Islands. The capital of that country, Honorea, uh, is uh, built on essentially the location where the Marines had their camp. So uh, the, um, <clears throat> you know, the history there in Guadalcanal really has cast a long shadow of the su subsequent history of the Solomon Islands. Um, I would scuba dived on several wrecks there. All of that, I think, is um, helpful in, in uh, giving you a feel for a place. Uh, and for that reason, I think it was a terrific trip to take. Uh, I had also planned to go to Guam and, um, and truck, which is in the Federated States of Micronesia. That was uh, the, uh, Japan's major fleet base outside the home islands. I had intended to do that last year and had to cancel the trip because of the pandemic. Uh, so I hope to get around to that. Um, so I personally am excited to ask this next question because this is the area that I'm most interested in with regard to the Pacific War. One of our participants points out the highly contrasting rate of survival among allied prisoners of war between those who were prisoners of the Germans who survived at about a 75% rate, give or take, versus those yeah. who were prisoners of the Japanese, whose survival rate was somewhere between 28 and 33%, so it's far, far lower. Can you talk a little bit about why that was the case? And I might throw in too, as we're looking at Twilight of the Gods, the conclusion of the war, what in the world was it like for the allied POWs to be rescued essentially at the end of this, to find that the war had ended, to try to come back to real life? Obviously volumes and volumes can be written just about that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the uh, you know the the story of the of Allied POWs in Japanese hands is one that I I didn't get a chance to go into really with this trilogy. Uh, I touched on it in places, but it was one of those things that I wanted to get more deeply into. And when it came right down to it, I just didn't have the space. Uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> you know, so there has been a lot of attention uh, to the subject. Um, in general, I, I think you have to say that uh, the Japanese treatment of prisoners was disgraceful. It was a disgrace uh, and one that they will be a part of their legacy forever. Um, and uh, I, I think that's well understood. In fact, I think maybe of almost every aspect of the Pacific War, uh, an understanding of, of you know, what our POWs went through is one of the things that's penetrated into our culture um, you can point to a book like Unbroken that seems like everybody read uh, as an example of that. I mean, many, many movies um, have, have dealt with it. So uh, I'm not sure what, what more you can say, except that, you know, in several discrete cases, the Japanese were unprepared to deal with prisoners. The Bataan Death March is a good example. The army simply had not made any provisions for transporting, feeding caring for maintaining uh, uh, prisoner camps. And, uh, and that led uh, directly to, to the, the uh, tragedies that, that occurred. Um, the experience of POWs upon being liberated, well, of course, it was um, you know, extraordinary joy uh, when uh, the Third Fleet went into Tokyo Harbor after the surrender. Uh, a number of uh, allied prisoners who were in prison camps right on the on the uh, harbor, uh, essentially began signaling to the fleet. Um, they were brought out to hospital ships, uh, many of them in emaciated condition and gained weight at a, at a sort of fantastic level. 
Many uh, allied POWs carried a, a deep and abiding hatred of the Japanese, really the entire nation of Japan, uh, until they died. There are some uh, remarkable exceptions to that as well, though, and I'm thinking of Pappy Boyington's famous memoir. Uh, he was the um, a Marine uh, squadron commander of the Black Sheep Squadron. He was a, a prisoner in Japan for about a year and a half. And um, and his memoir, uh, you know, he really distinguishes between the, the prison guards who he regarded as, as being sadistic and those who he kind of liked. And um, and he uh, actually came to take a great interest in, in Japanese culture, which he, you know, carried with him for the rest of his life. And so there's, a, you know, an interesting range of, of different stories uh, there. I think your uh, construction of war as a stress test for a society is true on macro levels, but also smaller levels. Like if you're a prisoner of war, if you're a guard, your nature comes out in a different way than it would under other circumstances. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so we have a question um, and then someone has asked my favorite wrap up one. Um, uh, is modern naval warfare really just a question of air superiority? Ships of war now just support the air war and someone else asks, are aircraft carriers obsolete? Well, uh, I, you know, I think the Navy would, would have a strong argument with the idea that aircraft carriers are obsolete. Um, you know, the uh, ability to be able to extend the range of your airplanes by launching them from different places at sea is a, a very powerful one. Um, <clears throat> I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in, in naval warfare as it's waged today. Uh, but I know enough to say uh, that um, really the Navy has a mission to support our amphibious forces, uh, to maintain the safety of the sea lanes. And uh, let's not forget the submarine fleet. We have, I think, something like 50, 55 different submarines. They have many different kinds of missions. And, um, and that's a very important part of what the Navy does and what it can do in the event of war. The relentless rise of China as a naval power uh, presents a significant challenge, which if we are going to continue to try to <clears throat> have the presence in that region that we have had in the past, uh, we are going to need to continually ensure that our Navy is the best in the world. Very interesting. Um, so a couple of people, uh, praise the current book, and I think uh, echo what I was sort of thinking. It's a little bit like the old commercial that says, "You've won the Super Bowl. Now, what are you going to do? What is what is coming up for you? Are you researching a new project now? And do you feel comfortable telling us about it?" Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm working on a few different things. Um, I do want to try my hand at fiction. It's very difficult for me to explain what I'm doing, um, but I. I would like to tell a story that is entirely my own. Uh, that is one that I've hatched from my imagination. And um, uh, I'm interested in the subjects of propaganda in war and intelligence and logistics. And I think out of those subjects, I think there are more books to be written about World War II, also about domestic politics during the war. <clears throat> so there's a number of other World War II books that I may want to tackle. And uh, someday I see writing a, a sequel to Six Frigates as well, uh, dealing with the war on the lakes uh, during the War of 1812. Excellent. Very good. So is there anything that you'd like to add, or has anybody got a final comment, something else to add in the chat uh, before we draw to a close with much gratitude for everybody's time and your terrific well, Sarah, I'll just say, you know, I'm really, <clears throat> I'm really happy that the library has been able to continue to do these events and that you and I were chatting before uh, we started. And now that the, we're sort of getting toward the end of the pandemic, uh, people are beginning to visit in greater numbers again. So I think that's great. Um, you know, I went through the World War II section at the New York Society Library, and I basically just started at the beginning. And I went through literally every book on the shelf, I'm not saying I read them all, but I looked at them all, everyone on the Pacific War. I pulled off the shelf and looked at it and decided whether I wanted to read it. 
And um, one, one great thing about a place like the library you have there is that because you've been collecting for a long time, you've got a lot of books that you just don't find in other places. And um, a lot of stuff in the 1940s, published in the 40s and 50s that you, you really wouldn't find unless you were looking for it and it's sitting there on the stack, in, on the shelves uh, in, in your stacks. And so I, I found that to be a, a real yeah. gold mine. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you. This was a wonderfully rich presentation and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ian Toll. Thank you, audience members, for joining us. Thank you very much.